Hello, everyone. Thank you for having us. Thank you for listening to us. Thank you for viewing us, whether you're in your living room, on your jog, or on your drive to work. This is season one, episode 10. And today, we are asking the question, what do you need to do to maximize your tech offer? So there are a number of ingredients that go into negotiating and maximizing your offer. We are assuming that you've passed all the grueling interviews, you've done all the whiteboarding, all the system design questions, all the lead coding to your heart's content, and now you have an offer. Hopefully you have multiple offers, so you can use that as leverage. But what goes into negotiating your offer? What goes into making sure you get the maximum to start off? Because once you are in the company, that's your baseline. And every increment is based off this starting point. So it's imperative. It's very important that you get this offer. Before we start, before we get into this, let's do a quick round of introduction. We have Louis, Mitra, Vic, Tiago, and myself here as panelists. We'll do a quick intro. Vic, do you want to start us off? Sure. My name is Vic. I am a staff engineer at Eventbrite. I also run a few SaaS products. Mitra? Hey, I'm Mitra. I'm an ex-founder and now an engineering leader at Startups and also an investor. I'll hand it off to Tiago. Hello, folks. I'm Tiago. I'm the former engineering manager from FANGS, and I'm currently a director of engineering in the FinTech. Louis? Hello, everyone. I'm Louis. I used to manage multiple engineering teams over at Walmart. I used to run Walmart's pharmacy. Before that, I worked at startups. And now, more, more recently, I've turned into an entrepreneur and I'm placing many bets. Uh, Kier? Thank you, Louis. My name is Kier Hindocha. I'm an engineering manager at a healthcare company based in Toronto. I manage a couple of teams right now. So back to our topic today, maximizing your tech offer. Tiago, I'll open with you. Do you want to share some thoughts? Yeah, sure. So. I think the one thing that I want to start this off is that's not only money. I would say all that we talked about in the previous episodes, the salary, signing bonus, equity, bonus, that's all great. But I would say when we talk about maximizing an offer, you also have to take in consideration the company person or the person company fit. And I would say... In that regard, I think you need to define what are the deal breakers or what are the things, what are your career values, what are the things that make you happy in a company? Where were you most happy or at your best self in the past? And even before you sign the offer, let's say once you reach the numbers that you like, and if you have multiple offers after negotiating it, or even before, I would say. You need to have that clear. What are you looking for? I think that's a really important thing that's often neglected. And I would say that in the past, I have tried to do the idea of the weighted uh, average as a way to see another dimension for the offers that I have. Sorry, can, I, can you explain your weighted average? What you mean by that? And what yes, goes yes. into that formula? So the way that average is, okay, the first thing is define your key criteria. What are the things that are deal breaker for you besides money? Assuming that money is out of the question, what are the things? And then out of those things, let's say you have five, what is the most important to the least important? And you can, let's say, give different weights for different criteria. Let's say that transparency is the big one for you. Or let's say that, let me pick another one, a company that's fast or a company that a lot of the communication is doing async, right? Or like a company that you have bare minimum meetings, right? Or you can pick your criteria and you can decide, okay, number one for me is I really want to work in a bottom-up company. I don't want to be getting things to do from top down and have to do. I actually want to be the ones like looking for metrics and like building up on top of that. And you say, okay, that's the most important thing for me. You put like the weight 10. And then like, like, oh, it's also important that I'm able to work remotely, let's say, or that I'm able to work from anywhere in the US or anywhere in Europe. You put that, okay, the second criteria, and then you give weight like eight. And then you do the, the, the weighted average matrix and you basically multiply every single criteria by their weight. And then you rank based on that. So that's the idea. I actually share a link in the show notes. It's actually a really standard thing if you work with like data is the way that 
sometimes you have to consider things. But I would say that's the starting point that I, I would bring to the discussion. That's a great point, Diego. So I guess in order to do any of this, you need to figure out what your worth is, right? So you need to obviously use the right data to value your skills. And so obviously your number of years of experience comes into play, what you have done in the past in terms of accomplishments. Uh, again, we, we can discuss this. I don't know if sticker value is a real thing or not. If you have previously worked at a FANG company, does that give you higher leverage? Does that, does that make you in a better position to, to, with greater leverage to negotiate higher? So I guess there are a number of places where you can start figuring out your net worth, right? So levels.fyi has a great calculator where you can put in a number of criteria. You can look at new offers only. You can put a time frame, and, and you'll know exactly what the company has offered in the past for exactly that level and that many years of experience. Obviously, if it's a much smaller company or if it's a startup, there might not be too much data there. So you might have to guess or use some wiggle room, but that might be a good starting point. Mitra, do you want to jump in? Yeah, just talking about like how you get leverage from past roles. I feel like it's not as much the company anymore that you worked at before. It's how people used to be really evaluated based on what college they were coming from, but now that's very different. We're open to a lot of different schools or not even a traditional background. And we've talked about that in the past episode. I feel the same way about past companies. What really matters is your role and what you did there. You could be one of thousands of engineers at Facebook, but did you really ship anything? Did you really own anything? Who knows? Or you could be a junior engineer at a startup for two years and have owned an entire product. So I think that's really what gives you the leverage, honestly, at the beginning of that interview process to demand what type of role you're looking for at this next place. Every company, especially startups, are going to call roles different things, but you really have to look at the scope and the type of work you'd be doing to evaluate where you fit in, I think. And then, uh, yeah, use that leverage of the great experiences you've had, any references you've had in your interviews. Hopefully you're talking a lot about the projects and the work you did, but bring that up again, that you expect a certain baseline of scope and opportunity, salary even, um, though I know there's, we should definitely talk more about who talks about salary first, but I feel like you want to leverage the actual work over a brand name. I, I totally agree. And things have changed significantly in the past five years where things that were valued very highly before are no longer valued as much. So in terms of where people can go to, to get information, I personally find Glassdoor isn't reliable for tech. So don't use Glassdoor, Payscale, or Comparably for tech-related data. I think H-1B visa filings, Angel list, triple byte, and blind are a lot more helpful. People will pretty honestly put stuff on blind and, and have exact numbers there that you can use as a reference. Again, they are not validated on blind, but levels.fyi validates them. So that is a better source of truth. If you can find your level and your company on levels, I would say start there. If not, go to blind and, and see if somebody has very specific numbers there that you can use as reference and as your starting point for leverage. There were a number of things that were brought up by, by Tiago and Mitra so far. So let's dig a little bit deeper. How do you differentiate between an offer from a startup versus a, a stable, mature company, both in terms of not just the offer that they have, but what else you have to gain. Obviously, the work culture might be different. The pace of things might be different. The innovation might be different. So what should you evaluate when you are looking at a startup versus a, a more mature company? Louis, did you want to chime in? Yeah, sure. So I recently had a, fr a friend of mine that I spoke to that actually managed to land a couple of offers. And but, but he said it was brutal because he had to interview... <laughs> He had to interview for two weeks straight and he obviously didn't land all of them. He managed to land about three 
and they took two weeks off of work or something. And every day he was doing full rounds and you could imagine what happened to the poor guy. So his brain was mush by the end of the two weeks, but he did have a couple of offers in hand and we were discussing them. And one of them was at a I'd say public, I wouldn't necessarily say big tech per se, reputable tech company. And the other one was at a scale up at a startup that, that has raised a ton of venture dollars. And he was evaluating those offers basically. And, and we went back and forth and, and we set up a framework. We, we said, look, what do you want in the short term? What do you want in the short term uh, out of this thing? And, and what do you want in the long term from it? And let's map those things out. Because if you're thinking of, let's say, if you're thinking of having a baby, probably my experience at a scale up is that <clears throat> it's going to be hard to take some paternity leave. There's going to be different things that you're going to be worried about. Again, not to say that all scale ups are the same, but generally they're hiring a lot of people. It's very stressful. They don't know if they're going to be able to raise the next funding round. All of those things matter, especially if they're fast moving and you're taking on more risk. If that's important to you, if you think you're, you're probably going to grow a little faster. And so he was evaluating these things. And, and also a bunch of other things came up, like the fact that there's been massive um, a massive hit to equity in, in these companies. So if you have an offer from a publicly traded company, I would evaluate what does your gut say about their stock? Because you're making a bet. You're basically being a stock picker at that point. You're saying, I'm betting, I'm, I'm going I'm to join this public company. They, they've taken an 80% hit. For example, I love Netflix, for example. I think their culture is good. And it, th this guy didn't have an offer in Netflix. I'm picking on Netflix because they had this stock hit. And so if I was to have a great offer with a ton of equity from Netflix, I would take that in a heartbeat because it's, I'm betting that it's going to go up like crazy. And so that's, that's the sort of thing we went back and forth on. And we were, do you believe that this publicly traded company is going to quote unquote moon? And it's probably going to be a more stable nine to five, which is if you're thinking of having a baby, that's really good. On the other side of that, this startup, there's some downsides to that now. They've taken, Gergay has a wonderful video on YouTube where he basically talks about the fact that, you know, the market has corrected significantly, but startup valuations have not corrected, right? Because they haven't raised money since 2021 or 2020. And so they're still operating at these insane valuations. And so you're going to get equity quoted to you from the last round that they were able to raise. And that equity is not worth that much anymore. Clearly, if Netflix took an 80% cut, or I don't know exactly how much their stock is down over the last year, but if they took that massive cut, chances are that startup also did. And so it's very important to, to factor that in to your comp. And, and so we went back and forth on that. And he actually ended up with going back to both of them and asking for more. Well, I'll get into that in a little bit, but I want to pass it to a couple of other people. But it was a very good ask. And you actually did end up getting more at one of them. Vic, I know you had your hand up. Um, go ahead and jump in. Yeah. So this ties into something I want to talk about, picking between different kinds of startups and evaluating cash versus equity. You said Netflix, and I'm going to pull on that thread. Netflix is almost uniquely different from a lot of the other fan companies because they make their offers almost entirely in cash as opposed to it being a certain amount of equity. So they will do, I don't know, you can end up with $500,000 in cash. I'm sorry I messed that up. I'm sorry I messed Netflix. It was just easy. No, but the, which is my opinion, right? That's like, Cash is king, okay? Base pay is king. If you, at this moment, were evaluating all tech stocks are unstable, what should I do? I have an offer for the same amount of total comp between Netflix and, I don't know, I'll pick on like Peloton, for example, right? You would go for Netflix in a heartbeat because you know that your total compensation doesn't go up and down depending on how the market is fluctuating. And it, and it removes you from this position of needing to be a stock picker and trying to evaluate. You should, of course, look at the broader market trends, right? You don't want to be a stock picker when you're finding a role. Like, but you, you shouldn't have to look at Netflix's you know, subscriber numbers or whatever in order to pick a job. But my point was cash versus equity is going to be a pretty big deal for people trying to pick which job they want. At what stage of their life are they in right now? Psychological safety is another huge one. One thing I'll say is that when you start at someplace really small, they have far less mature processes in place like HR. And you don't have as much, first of all, you don't have as many data points of people to talk to, to figure out what kind of organization it is. You don't have the ability to move between different teams. If you don't have, if you have a falling out with your manager, there's one other team or whatever. And the one last thing I'll say there is your life stage is really going to determine what benefits are important to you. Maybe you're a, a single woman who has no plans of having a child anytime soon, you don't care about parental leave, like PTO is important to you. But these benefits, you're going to weigh benefits completely differently. Louis, I think you wanted to say something about Netflix stock. No, I just, Vic, I just wanted to, to say that I think I completely agree with you that that cash comp is important, but I, I do think it's a unique opportunity where 
you have these great companies that are at a pretty good discount. So why, why wouldn't you bet on the stock? If you believe, and maybe Netflix was a bad example, but let's take another company that took a big hit in stock and we know it's a good one long-term. And so why wouldn't you want to come in? Because your whatever your equity grant is, let's say it's a hundred thousand dollars. They're going to cut, they're going to go buy stock at today's price and give it to you. Oh, sure. That, yeah. That, that's going to get locked up somewhere. You can't, it's going to vest over some period of time, but it's going to be locked up and, and you're going to get those refreshers. And so if the thing is, if you think it's going to go up, that's a great way to play around with the market without actually putting in money. I would say don't neglect that. Like you could become a millionaire just from the stock, especially like you go into Google or you took, I don't know. So there's a couple of them that took pretty big hits that you are great companies long-term. They're not, well, they're yeah, not going to go under. There are a number of people recently that have been jumping companies solely for the equity. And th there's a lot of threads online where people will jump ship just for the equity because base isn't going to change that much. And based on how much the stock has taken a hit or when their shares are vesting, a, a lot of people do change companies. It's sad, but to Louis' point, that can break a, a million or two easily depending on where you're going, at what level you are going. Tiago, do you want to jump in? Uh, I wanted to discuss psychological safety. I, I don't know if you wanted to touch on that. How do you determine that after your interview, from a personal experience, it's, it's very hard to determine that. Even if you talk to, let's say, two or three people who say it's great, that's not the team you might end up in, or they might be wearing rose-tinted glasses where they see everything is hunky-dory, but when you get there, it's a crapshoot. And, and psychological safety is the number one thing a lot of people look for. So how do you evaluate that, especially before you start? All right, that's a great topic, but I actually want to go back one and then I would go in psychological safety because I love that topic actually. But okay, so another thing that when I talk about the dimensions beyond money, right? Beyond cash is I think Vic nailed it is fixed income versus like equity that is crazy as the stock market. So I think that's one thing that really, I think it's clear here that Vic is more on the safe side and, and Lou is more taking big bits. <laughs> so I would say that's a difference in profiles, right? Like some people really, they would actually have less in the long term, but have that safety in place. But I think the, the other dimension we want to say, the other two actually, one is career progression, sorry. So does the company that you're working for, what is the promotion model? How are the performance cycles? Do they have levels clear? And even if they are a startup or they only have the, the three, let's say, high level levels as like junior, not senior and senior, and then your dad after that. I think is one really important thing that after maybe five years getting stuck and ha having a lot of frustrations with this, you start to value a lot. So I think it's something that maybe is the top reason why someone is leaving a company and joining another is to join a company where the career ladder is super clear and they have visibility they there is no bullshit right there's no okay like it's open-ended no it's really like clear and that is actually a really nice website that i want to share here it's called progression.fyi and it's a website that actually compiled the best public career frameworks from companies out there and put together so you can actually Go and if you are like engineer manager or director, or whatever, building a career ladder for your org, you can reuse a lot of things from those open source career ladders. And the second thing I want to say before I go to psychological safety is in the, in the book Accelerate that a lot of people are super familiar with, they talk about the, the well-strung model of organization culture, right? They basically classify all the organizations in three categories, right? There are the pathological organizations, the bureaucratic organizations and the generative organizations. And I think the pathological ones are the ones that are characterized by low cooperation. The, the messages get punished. Responsibilities are not clear, like where failure is punished. And let's say on the other side, the, the generative companies where there's like a high trust, high cooperation, where information flows, where risks are encouraged, all those things. I think that's another thing to take a look is what kind of organization is the, the one that you're joining? Are titles a big thing and you're not allowed to go, let's say, do something that's not under your job responsibilities? Or is things are a lot more clear? Is the promotion uh, process based on your individual performance, but not necessarily on 
blue work or what you do on the day to help your team besides the expectations of the next level? Uh, I will stop here and I'll, I'll let Mitra go and come back to psychological safety. Okay. Uh, and, and maybe w- one of you can touch on how you go about determining that upfront. Go ahead, Mitra. Yeah, yeah. I think w- one thing related to what Thiago is saying, it depends also on your level, I think, and what you're looking for. So for example, I'll give myself as an example, I'm currently looking for senior leadership opportunities and I'm actually looking for places that don't have a career ladder in place necessarily, or don't have a lot of this in place, but are very open and wanting someone to come in and help define that. So these are things that I ask in interviews to be able to assess out where the company's at. And I'll ask not just the, maybe my would be manager, but I'll ask other engineers. I'll ask my peers, I'll ask product and design folks about the company culture, but also what their own opportunities have looked like in the time that they've been there. And yeah, I'm, I want to understand and be very clear with, and I think this is what everyone should be doing in interviews is be very clear with what you want to do. Even if you're not exactly sure what that is yet, let's say in the next year or two that you want to get promoted or you want to have some sort of outsized impact or own a whole product area, whatever it is, make sure you really clarify that in interviews and see the response. If they're like, great, that's what we expect from our engineers or managers or whatever, a good place to keep moving. If they're like, okay, interesting. Maybe when you get to the next level, that's something we can talk about. Then that's something for you to also consider. But yeah, I, I think it, it all depends on your like stage in your career and stage in life and what you're really looking to do mixed with, of course, like everyone's talked about the different benefits. I know we've talked about equity grants and base salary. I know something that people don't often negotiate is a signing bonus, relocation bonus, perhaps even additional benefits, like additional time off again, going back to like your values and what you really want at this time of your life. So I feel like get a little creative also, especially in this existing market where salary might be not as negotiable for some companies. What else are they willing to spend a little more on to get you? So you mentioned time off as one of the, the criteria. A, a lot of companies now offer unlimited flexible paid time off, but depending on the culture of the company, some say one week for every year of service, some say we don't really care what you do. Some say as long as you get your job done, you can take as much time as you want, which means never. Um, how do you evaluate that as part of your comparison criteria? Because before it used to be very distinct, like two, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, it's in your offer letter. You have to take it. If you don't take it, it gets rolled forward. You get to accrue some, if not most of it, even if you have more, you can work it out with your manager. All that goes out the window with unlimited vacation. How do you guys loop that into your... I, I want to actually go back to psychological safety now. And I'm, I'm always one question behind. But okay, so the... Okay, how do you evaluate psychological safety? I think that's a hard, like a super hard one. But I would say there is a book uh, called the... What is the name of the book? The Fearless Organization. And Amy, I forgot her last name. She's the expert on, on that. And she has a, a, like what's called the, the PSI. That's the index for evaluating psychological safety. And I think there are four domains of psychological safety. And I just read the big four categories and some of the questions that she recommends to look at, not necessarily ask, but be creative about how you, you think about this. So the first dimension of psychological safety is inclusion and diversity. And th- those are not the same thing. The second one is attitude towards risk or failure. The third one is willingness to help. And the last one is open conversation. And I think the along with that, if you actually take the psychological safety test, that's something that they go to the organization, they spend a week talking to people and looking at projects and all that, you're going to have different indexes. But I think the powerful questions that I have from the book that I, I think are that my help is, is I think one question is look at how the company or the, the particular group has handled mistakes in the past. So ask, okay, tell me about a time where someone or your team made a big mistake that caused a big issue to the business. How was that taken? Second one is, are people actually talking about the problems or they're actually afraid of talking about problems. Like a good question would be, tell me about the the top three issues that 
appeared in the last retrospective or in the last, let's say, like outage that you had, right? Like in the post-mortem, right? The, ne- the next one is like, is are people willing to disagree with each other? And like how much and how, right? Is do people like, and that's the good challenging is like, you want to see folks disagreeing and like proposing different ideas and even saying, this is not good. I have a better idea, right? And not even be afraid of, of correcting their, let's say, their leaders. And that's actually a good question to ask. Tell me about a time where someone on your team gave you a feedback and made you, but you actually, and you look at the answers and you evaluate how deep it is. Is, is it surface level? Is it some, something that they're, ma- they're making up or there is actually a story behind it? And like another one is, tell me about a time where someone spent a week, a month doing something that was not directly related to their job title, but was critical for the project. It, there are m- multiple like, ways that uh, you can assess, but I think taking consideration of those four domains and you can go as deep as you, you want. And I strongly recommend the Fearless Organization book. I think there is actually chapter four that's like, that chapter alone is already worthwhile, the, the whole book. Now, Kair, I'll leave. I forgot what was the question that you asked. So, so, sorry. So, so just jumping back to the, the flexible pay type off, I just wanted to, to ask how the panelists usually oh. evaluate that for your offer. I actually, I call that bullshit. Or I actually say, if you have a limited time off, I'm out. I, I, I have been in that position before where we had unlimited quote unquote, and it was a joke. I actually prefer when people tell me, okay, everyone gets a 20, 25 or 15 days. And if you don't take, you lose it. I actually, I prefer much rather that because I have seen what happens when you have folks taking 45 days off and folks not being able to take a week. And I like all the theories that, oh, if you do your job in less time, then you should be able to like take more time off than someone because you're more effective. But I never seen that in reality in 15 years. So it's like, that's why I, I'm, I'm willing to be proven wrong or, or organization where people are actually able to be the 10X engineers and okay, your impact is what matter and you're not damaging your coworker. Never seen that. Vic. I have thoughts here. So Eventbrite is one of those organizations that has unlimited time off. And my position on that when I came in was that this is, it's a trap because the reason why companies do unlimited time off is that because it is not a liability on the books. And when you leave the organization, when you are laid off and you're fired, they don't have to pay that out and they don't have to track the amount of money they owe you. And when it's unlimited time off, there's nothing, there's no, it's no accounting, nothing. You just, when you leave, that's it, it's gone. So a question that I asked when I was interviewing at Eventbrite was, how much vacation did you take off? Have you taken so far? Actually, I was interviewing in January, so I asked, how much vacation did you take last year? Which is a good representative sample of how much did you do? And and my the person who would have been my manager said, I tried to take a minimum of five weeks, and then more after that if I feel like it. Eventbrite has basically a take the time you need sort of policy. And I also wanted to know, how do you log the time? How do you know if people are taking time off? And his answer to that, and it, and it was honest and accurate, was that they don't track. They explicitly don't want to track how much time you're taking. Sorry, they don't log. There's no logging system. You just tell your team that you're going to be on. And it's entirely a team matter. So the thing I'll say there is, right, your team might have a, oh, you can only take time off when you're done with work. And so... The bad thing about unlimited time off is that it's inconsistent across teams. Now, I've been lucky to be on a team where everyone was so very, I'm just, I don't have enough energy today. I just want to take the rest of the day off. And everyone would say, cool, talk to you later. And no one would think that person has been off three days this week or anything like that. So that's my big thing there. We also have a guaranteed minimum number of days, just because if I took zero time off, as, as part of my unlimited time off, there are still something like 21 company holidays. So I would be effectively forced into taking at least three weeks off, which is a month of not working. I'm getting paid really for 11 months of working right off the bat. So you have to make sure that you ask what the policy is, how people are telling your team that you're taking time off. You have to figure out 
how much time is that team taking off? Is your manager making sure that you take at least a certain amount of time off? Because when you started a company, you're thinking, I don't want to be that person who takes, I don't want to be that person who comes in and takes a week off. And so you keep putting off that time, you put, keep putting it off, you keep putting it off. And next thing you've taken like a week of PTO all year. And the thing about unlimited time off is that it can make you feel guilty as opposed to when you're assigned a certain amount of time and you think I've earned this, I've earned two weeks off for all the time I've worked so far. So I'm going to take the time off that I've earned. Unlimited time off puts the onus on you of taking time that you want when you don't feel like you've earned it and it ends up becoming a problem. So it's very important to have a good manager and a good team culture of people taking time off. And, and there's no good way to really evaluate that except asking questions and I guess going on blind or something where I like blind for this, unlike say Glassdoor, because you can ask questions that people answer. It's a forum sort of thing. And yes, some people answer incorrectly or dishonestly, but the law of average just takes that, takes care of that for you. You end up 15 replies and one person says it's great and 10 others say, no, it's terrible. You have something from that. Louis, what's up? I want to hear your thoughts. Yeah, no, I just wanted to harp on the same topic. We used to have this uh, unlimited time off at Jet, and obviously Jet was a was a very fast moving startup. The, the the first year I was there, I, I couldn't really take too much time off. I think we discussed this on the last step. The unlimited time off was there, and they did the right thing in terms of maternity and paternity leave. They actually paid people for the time they didn't take, which was nice. But and then that became a policy. But I think they did on paper have this unlimited time off, which is looking back, it's very deceiving. But then after we got acquired by Walmart, we were in a very good position. Basically, right before we got acquired, I'd say we were in a pretty good position because we had actually fleshed out these teams. There were no longer skeleton crews trying to trying to keep things up by 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 any means. There were decent sized teams, and I, I would say that impacts how much time you're going to be able to take off too. What kind of team are you going into? Do they have a critical mass to support the system? What kind of systems are they supporting? You know, all of that matters, right? Because if you're in a team of three people and you take vacation. And who's going to, like, when the paging happens, what happens? So all, all that stuff really matters. So by the time Walmart acquired us, I, I would say, which wasn't very long, it was only about a year that I was, it was a very fast moving startup. And it was only about a year that I suffered in terms of that. But for me, again, I, it was totally worth it. It's not like I regret it. But for people that, that care about that, that need that, I think that there's all the stuff you said, Vic, is, is a really good way um, to tease it out. How much vacation did you take? last year and where did you go <laughs> oh, so, you, so you can know if they're full of crap and, and were you able to disconnect were you able to did you have to bring your laptop with you simple questions like that they might seem silly but i think they're actually going to tell you they're going to be very telling in places where it's not explicit and one thing we did after the acquisition on our teams we set a minimum amount of weeks you had to take off and the reason we had to set that because we had one or two people from the old school from the days before the acquisition that would never take time off and and i had to like you have to take time off. What are you doing? Like this is, you haven't, you've taken two weeks the whole year. We have unlimited PTO. You're stressed out. Get out of here. Just go. I don't care where you go. Just go. And we set up a minimum of five weeks. Most people would take between six to eight, which is very normal. And I think that that's a good environment, but we set that up as a group. We set that up on our team and the policy across the company was very different between teams. And as you would imagine, some teams very different on call rotations, very different demands on their schedules. And so the team, for example, that was keeping the core e-commerce platform up and running had, had a very different on-call schedule than my team that was doing personalization and CRM and, 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 and segmentation and ad tech and emails. You know, that stuff went down. It's important, but it's not like you can't shop right now, which is that's the core business. If you can't do that, then somebody's going to get really mad. So those are the kinds of things that I think you need to evaluate when you go in. What sort of demands is, is the CEO of the company like hounding this team all the time if they are there's going to be a lot of pressure on your time that could be good and bad that could be really good because now you have somebody's eyes on that if you care about career progression that could be very good for you but it could also be very bad if you care about some the other stuff that we just discussed so you know mithra had her hand up i'm sorry i took a little bit long-winded answer but minimum is very good mithra go ahead no, I totally agree with minimums. And I think it's really useful to hear from people's individual experiences in different companies. I have a data point from Glossier. It's not unlimited time off. It's set 20 days, but they actually somehow structure it where they'll only roll over a certain amount. And if you leave or they let you go, they won't pay those vacation days out. So it's not just unlimited time off that you have to watch out for. You really have to ask HR when you're considering something like how do they really consider 
their time off? How does it work with paying or getting paid off? I also have noticed in some interviews, the leaders, like the VPs and C-suite, they might be more compelled to say, I take my time off and I make sure to go on vacation to set a good example, but I never hear the engineers or the people who I would be working with talk about it. So you really want to ask those folks, do you feel like you're allowed to take time off? And like Louise mentioned, like you can go and on call won't blow up and you can actually be unplugged. And I feel like that's just a super important data point that points to the culture that we've been talking about that should all come into play when you're thinking about which companies you want to negotiate for and eventually go to. Tiago? So I actually want to share first the story. So I worked in a startup that had the unlimited PTO policy and it was actually good and bad, but I had great experience with one particular manager. And one thing that he used to do and that I thought was really nice and changed the game is he would force folks to take PTO. So he would come and say, okay, Guess what? You are cheering at home and I'm going to call you if something is off after this project. And he would do it. So he would say, okay, we have this really important client. We have to finish this. But once he's live, you're out for two weeks. And he would like pretty much do every single one of this, his promise. And I think it was awesome when it started to happen. And you actually, you, you feel the... It is okay. It's not great that you have to take PTO on a time that sometimes you're not planning for, but you would give some time, some weeks ahead of like advanced notice. So you would know, and he would almost like feel that in one-on-ones and he would, okay, you have to take off like a week in the next month, pick one. If you're not picking, I would pick one for you. And I think that was awesome, but it's, it's rare to see a leader like that is actually taking and doing the work and let's say I'm going to handle the own call and you're going to talk to other folks. Uh, I think that is like a stress test of the system, right? Even if you're a small startup, I think you can do that. Of course, there'll be a lot of coordination needed. And the other two questions, I was looking some old notes from a course I did on psychological safety and the, the two other questions to ask that I found was really good. One is how much appreciation is being shared among the team members? Like how much are people sharing what others are doing? Not only feedback, right? Appreciation. And uh, the the other one was, man, I lost on this uh, screen of events, but I think it is it, it was something along the sharing bad news. Anyways, I just want to add that. Vic? Yeah, I, I have something to say about the psychological safety thing. I have previously, after an interview, when people have said, hey, you can feel free to add me on LinkedIn or something like that. Like you have a pretty good interview. And uh, first, that's a good sign because it means that they think that you passed the interview. And I have, when they, especially when they say something like that, I do add them on LinkedIn. And I have then messaged them to ask you know, questions off the record. So for example, at this interview that where this particular interview said, feel free to add me on LinkedIn, there were multiple people in the interview and people feel less like they can be honest with you when there's when someone else is watching. So I did end up messaging that interviewer and I said, tell me about, tell me about how it's been for you. I noticed that you've been there for so many years and how much vacation have you taken? Like the same questions that you ask in like an interview setting where people come like really prepared for it, they just get way more candor. And you can also, honestly, even after you've, you're considering joining, you can add people on LinkedIn and you can say, I'm planning on joining your company and as a staff engineer. And I have some questions if you don't mind asking, find people on the, on the LinkedIn of like other employees here that look like you, that look like they have your background and people are going to be so okay. And once again, the law of averages, right? Ask three people if you want to figure out how is it like in your organization in terms of psychological safety? How do you feel as a person of color? Or let's say that you say, hey, can you ask, you can ask the recruiter, can you connect me with someone from your LGBTQ group that you have in your organization for me to ask them some questions? They will, in a good organization, they will connect you to someone for you to ask them questions. Okay. Yeah, th those are some great points. And it shows the importance of psychological safety, right? I, I know here we are discussing maximizing your offer. It's evident based on the diverse experience we have among the panelists here that it's not just the money. There's, it's not just the vacation. It's not just the, the kind of projects and the 
stage of the company, but it's a lot of other factors at work as well. So uh, just to, to summarize psychological safety, I think it's a shared belief, right? By the members of the team that others on the team will not embarrass or reject or punish you for speaking up. There will be no repercussions and you feel comfortable you feel comfortable being yourself, you bring your whole selves to work, you feel okay laying yourself on the line. There is no consequences there. I have been parts of companies where the, the company salute was literally middle fingers pointing in both directions as soon as uh, something went down. As soon as there was an outage, it's not what went down, it's who did it. That was the first question that was asked and and you did the salute and said, it wasn't me. And, and you point your fingers on in both directions and say, yeah, yeah, it was either that guy or that guy, but it wasn't me because the consequences are that you, you will get fired, your manager will get fired and all the way up the food chain. So that's not the kind of toxic culture that you want to be in because guess what? You, you'll never make innovative decisions there. You'll never take risks. You'll never swing the needle so far out. You'll make incremental changes because you'll be too concerned, too scared, and you'll never innovate or grow in, in a company like that, in a team like that. Go ahead, Vic. Sorry, I just want to add one more thing that I found very useful to ask in an interview. And you don't know at what point in the interview you're going to ask. It doesn't make sense in your screening interview, maybe, but as you're like close to an offer or something, I have asked how the last production incident and postmortem was handled because everything until then, interviewers train. I'm not saying they lie, but like interviewers say so much. But when you go into storytelling mode, you end up getting a lot more details. And I like asking about what was the last production? So what can you tell me about it? And then they say, oh, something broke. And by the way, some companies have you sign an NDA before they will answer that question. But most are more than happy to tell you. They won't go into like super specific. Anyways, this company told me like, oh, our S3 bucket, someone clicked the encrypt button and we had a massive outage and we basically hit everyone on call and we said, hey, jump onto this Google Meet room. There's no blame culture. Here's the postmortem document we created. They're like, please don't take a screenshot, but here's what it looks like. And here are the five whys we did. And we basically said, we need better documentation around these decisions. And I was like, that's great. This is a very healthy culture. It's not like Vic did it. Don't let Vic handle issues at 9 a.m. or whatever. It was like, one of the issues they did identify was this decision was not brought up in this main room because someone would have said, hey, there's some weird archaic reason for why that particular bucket is not encrypted. And they would have told you that. And, and it was still not blaming the person. It was blaming the process. And you want to hear that because that tells you a lot about the culture. But they spent time thinking about this. I like asking questions that they could not have possibly prepared for because a different person comes out of those. That's all I have. Back to you, Kira. Just want to add another one is if, it, if they can share something like a document that <laughs> with you on the spot or like something that was not really prepared for, that's usually a really good sign. If you're like, oh, look at here, I have a Slack channel for this. And like that to me, it shows a lot of transparency. I know it's hard for liability and all that, but I think exactly what you said, Vic, if off the channels, like dig in and like, and show you the, their post post-mortem template or like even like an actual post-mortem. I think that can be faked always, but is usually a really good thing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that usually shows both, right? Like one, you have a process in place uh, and B, you're good at documenting for to, to reference as well. So it, people know next time as well. And you can look at the five whys and, and figure out, are they calling out teams in there? Are they calling out people in there? Are they referring to the infrastructure? Are they referring to particular? Uh, so, so you'll get a lot of knowledge based on that confluence page, which documents the postmortem or, or whatever document or whatever format they are in. That, that's a great point. So just switching gears uh, a little bit, I just wanted to get into the compensation that you want to negotiate. Who should propose the first number? Should it be you as a candidate? saying this is the range I want to be in or a specific number if you want to have one in mind? Or should you wait for the recruiter to, to throw you a number and then you say silent and let them raise their game? I've, I've seen both sides of the argument. I've also seen that the first person to throw out a number is the loser or the first number that gets thrown in the conversation. That's your anchor point and 
and you go plus or minus based on that anchor. So what are some tactics that you guys have used or are familiar with, given that most of you have been on both sides of the fence, right? Both offering, making offers to candidates and obviously applying for jobs yourself. So can you share some tactics or some strategies that you've used that have worked well for you? I'll jump in here. I want the recruiter to tell me first their salary range, but they're not always so willing to. Sometimes they'll come back with, it really depends. What are you looking for? They want, they have the same goal, right? They want us to tell them first. I'd say as much as possible, ask them and say, I want to know your range. I know it differs per company. So I want to know what it is before we move further. Sometimes, and a lot of times I've noticed nowadays, they won't even bring up salary in the first conversation. So I'll send a follow-up email and say, quick question. Can you give me a rundown on the benefits, the salary range, like all these things that maybe you don't spend much time talking about in the actual interviews. If they do ask, I used to get my ideal salary in the middle range. So if my ideal was like 180, I'd say 160 to 200. I've learned since that is not the way to do it. And I think this is something women in particular do a lot. We like to try and be fair from the outset, but we should be giving our ideal as maybe the lowest range or even lower than the range that we give them. And of course, you're not pulling numbers out of your ass. You're looking at your previous salary, you're looking at your current company, perhaps you're looking at levels and there's a lot of good data out there to pull numbers, but I'd say, give yourself some good leverage. I've seen on the other side as a hiring manager, women come in and definitely lowball themselves. And for a senior engineer, for example, it's a pretty wide range. That pay band is pretty wide. And so recruiters are going to go off of you. If you tell them I want 175 and technically they can go up to 230, they're not going to go up to 230 for you. And so I had this situation where a female engineer crushed all her interviews. We were super excited to hire her and we were about to extend an offer at the lower point because that is the number she gave. And I had to really fight, talk to like multiple recruiters and even more senior folks in the company to say, just because she gave us this number doesn't mean we should value her at that because your number, as we all know, it it follows you and you could lose thousands of dollars over your lifetime. I, I think on the other end, it's always important to look out for folks who may be undervaluing themselves when they come in and just you as a hiring manager trying to get an equitable view. But yeah, from the point of us being the ones negotiating, always try and get the numbers from them first. See if that pay band like fits for you. For some folks, as I'm interviewing right now, the pay band was just too low. And I've outright said, this really doesn't fit with what I'm looking for, but maybe we'll circle back later. So you just want to make sure that if you go through the whole interview process and then you end up with the salary that you're not happy about, that's really tough. So I would say try and get it from them from the beginning. Louis? Yeah, I think you said most of what I was sort of thinking go into it. I think all, all of that, basically getting the pay band really important, ne negotiating. N negotiating is a tough thing, right? So when you go in, I think you should figure out what's most important to you. You should figure out, is it going to be the equity for me? Is it going to be, and you should have this in mind because a lot of places have flexibility in some things and they don't have flexibility in others. And it's really hard to tease that out. It's really hard to tease that out from just a pay band. And I think that part of it is basically so important. I've had candidates where we extended offers and they cared so much about the bonus, let's say. They wanted to buy a house by next year. They had these goals. They wanted a lump sum. And we could figure something out, right? Because that's not going to impact numbers the same way. That might be um, totally different. And so all, all of these things, there's so many components to an engineering package and, 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 and you should focus on the one that means most to you. I know most people will tell you just focus on base salary, but the truth is base salaries are, you know, accounted for very differently. And they're usually the least flexible part, the negotiation. And that's the big challenge, right? And so you want to try to maximize your income, but money is money at the end of the day. So whether it's coming to you in the bonus, it's going to get taxed a little bit differently, but you're still money. And similarly with the equity. And, and the other thing I would say is that is advice that I gave to my friend, thinking short term and then thinking long term, what do you what are the things that you've got going on in your own sort of life and then maximizing for that? And then keeping in mind that if you're negotiating with the hiring manager, that's going to be your potential boss. So you don't want to negotiate with them. You don't want to kill them in the negotiation. You don't want them to hate you going in. And so I think you need to make your problems their problems. And, and one really big deal, and I know a lot of people 
don't recommend this, but I recommend it all the time to people. Tell them about you and your life and why you need this money. And then say, look, I'm looking to move because I'm looking to buy a house. And how am I going to do it? And you make it their problem. Or I'm looking. And the reason why I need to move is I'm having a kid or I just had a kid or whatever, whatever it is. And you say, I need this money for this reason. And it's going to be difficult for me to explain to my family this offer that I got and justify this move. And maybe that, maybe that's a little bit backwards, but I really, I, I think it goes a long way and it, it puts people in your shoes and they end up having to fight for you. They end up having to go back to HR and, and making requests that they wouldn't normally make just because you've justified it. You've really laid it out and, and you've, you've laid out the things that you care about. If you make it soulless, if you make it heartless, if you don't tell them why you need this money, why this is so important to you, why. And, and, and again, it's not just, it's not just about money. We talked about all these other factors, but I really do think connecting it and, and that worked for my friend, basically went back and said, look, the base salary is excellent. All these other things are really good, but the equity compensation I'm getting is basically less than the equity that I have right now. And a big reason why I want to be in a company, I want to be long-term. I want to be here and I want the upside. And so I, I somehow, I would love to, you know, I don't want to be here. And then in a year or two, my, my comp falls below a certain number. And I'm, I'm basically looking to grow with this company. And basically he made the case for himself. But my point is, I think having a good story around that, it's so important. Don't neglect that. Don't just, don't just say, I want X. <laughs> and that's it. And if you can't get to that, I'm not going to take it. That's not, I, I don't think that's a good way to negotiate with humans. Um, Tiago. Yeah, I want to double down on everything that you and, and Mitra said. And I think those are really unconventional advices when it comes to silent negotiation, because it's okay. It's like one is a lot of people say, don't trust the recruiter, right? Like don't be friends of the recruiter, but actually can be a great idea if you're talking to a great recruiter and if you're able to share a good story or not like a real story and give facts, like they might use that and a good story can be really powerful. Of course, people like say, yeah, don't tell me like uh, your personal stories, tell me how you're going to add value to the company, all that bullshit. But I think the moment that you are trying to negotiate an offer and get like that final salary and they have flexibility because is as we said in one of the previous episodes the hiring budget is always higher than the forgot the, the term the hiring the, versus retention, bonus. retention bonus right or the retention budget and the other thing i would say so like just repeating what you guys said and trying to summarize so is one is exactly what mitra said if you can and especially if you are in a position of power where the recruiter is reaching out to you and the one scattered that initial call is always great to ask, okay, what kind, I'm not really looking for, but what kind of like total comp are we talking about? I might be interested depending on that. And if you're really like, you're really in a position of not giving an F, I think that might be a good way. Or another way would be, okay, you do the call. And after that, if you have the phone number of the recruiter, you send a text and then that might be out of the, let's say, channels that they have like liability concerns and just asking a friendly way i really love what you said but i'm really concerned about salary and ask if they can tell you before if they can't then the next step would be do your research and i think i mentioned that in a previous episode try to do a deep research it's going to take you afternoon but i think especially if it's a well-known company it's not a really small startup you have tons and tons of data there. And I think levels FYI, H1B, visa, prevailing wage, and do the, the average of average are like, and as Mitra said, don't pick the average. Pick maybe, I like to say the P85, because that is going to filter folks that are really like on a crazy high that might have entered the information to be misleading, but are going to be on the kind of uncomfortable zone, but not like at the edge. And if they get you and they say, oh, this is too high for us, you can always say, okay, I'm actually willing to go a little down on the base salary or on the equity, but you should do your research and talk as a professional, okay, based on the research for this company, for New York, for Seattle, for 10 plus years of experience, like myself coming from, give as much context as you can. Like, and I think that can help you to justify. And, and third is what Louis said. If, okay, you have done that, you have shared things or you have, but that's still not enough because of personal, personal reason. Like it's not only because you want more, but actually there is something underneath that. Share that, right? You have nothing to lose. The worst case scenario, you're going to stay with the offer as you have it. That's it, folks. Care? 
Thank you, Tiago. That summarized it very nicely. So that's it for today. Just some closing thoughts. I know none of this was conventional advice, and this is what I like about this group of people. Very candid, very open, and very fearless in, in what we share. So thank you for all of your honest comments. I know it comes from the heart. I was reading Sheryl Sandberg's book, Lean In, recently, and, and one of the quotes that stuck out to me was, what would you do if you weren't afraid? And this relates nicely to this topic as well. Just before you sign that offer, hopefully you have multiple offers, what would you do if you weren't afraid? This is the last episode for season one. You can check us out on engineeringadvice.dev. All of our links are there. But otherwise, thank you for taking this tech journey with us. See you next time. Bye.